everyone knows he's a big star and a big guy. He's tough, he's fast, and you don't want to get on his bad side. You're going to learn some things about Steven Seagal that you wouldn't believe. Most of the world knows Steven Seagal as a movie star, action hero, and seventh degree black belt Aikido master. But there are a lot more facets to this international icon that can only be revealed by the people who know him best. The best thing about working with Steven is probably his sense of humor. <laughs> you wanna play rough? I can play rough. Sorry, I'm not into men. I knew him first as a movie star, but when he starts to play, you recognize that he can play and he's good at what he does. It's sort of a zen mind, you know, you just kind of float on through. Stephen has given so much money away and so much time away that his closest friends and family have been concerned that he's going to revert to becoming a monk and giving everything away. You think you know all there is to know about Steven Seagal? You don't know Jack about this movie star. So I bet you like an autograph, huh? Whatever. Yeah, I can't believe it's me either. In 1988, out of nowhere, Steven Seagal suddenly appeared on the big screen, starring in an action movie. But the most surprising thing was that this little film turned out to be a blockbuster that knocked Hollywood on its butt. I had never done a soap commercial. I had never done anything, ever. His feature made millions and launched Steven's career as a producer, writer, star, and a force to be reckoned with in Hollywood. That's what he is to me, a superstar. He's a very talented young man. He can't seem to do anything wrong. He has hordes of fans all over the place. You know, I'm, I'm a fan of his, you know, I love Mark for death. <laughs> One of my favorite movies. The funny thing is, if you'd seen him when he was real young, you'd have thought he was just an average kid growing up in Detroit. He came from an average family. His dad was a high school math teacher, and his mother was a medical technician. But there were a couple of things that set Steven apart. A real passion for music, and a downright obsession with Japanese martial arts. I was interested in the martial arts from five years old. I'd seen a martial art demonstration at a football halftime with some old oriental master that was doing a multiple man attack thing, and I was amazed. And I had to do it. Stephen dedicated himself to the study of martial arts with many different teachers. Eventually, he focused on the study of Aikido, known as the art of divine harmony. It's a defensive martial art, and it's, it's a lot more about utilizing the other person's, you know, offensive behavior towards you in a defensive manner, and hey, they get hurt, you know? Along the way, he also discovered Asian religion, philosophy, and ancient healing practices. They pulled at him in a way he couldn't explain. And when he was just 17, he said goodbye to his family and moved to Japan. Forgive me for sounding cliche, but I think it's karma. Got over here and started, you know, fulfilling my dreams, studying all the things I wanted to study. I spent a long time learning bone manipulation, acupuncture, herbology, Buddhism. I studied martial arts with all the different masters I could find all over Japan and around Asia. Back then, there weren't a lot of Westerners in Japan. It was almost unheard of for an American teenager to show up all alone, not knowing anyone, and not speaking a word of Japanese. When I first came here, it wasn't unusual to have people, you know, kind of make remarks about seeing a foreigner for the first time. That was a challenge, and Stephen didn't make it any easier on himself. He became an uchideshi, which is a student who lives and works in a dojo where they teach the art of Aikido. It was a hard life. It 
When I became an Uchideshi in Shinjuku, a live-in student to one of the masters, it's their job to try to break you in any way they can so that you'll leave. We, we were fighting, fighting fools every day, all day, for eight to 12 hours a day. And it would not be uncommon to break a bone or break a finger or break a toe or break a nose or knock your teeth out. Whatever it would be, you would, you would keep training. You would keep training. After years of study, he earned a seventh degree black belt. And this very young man was given master's credentials in Aikido. In 1975, he became the first Westerner to open his own dojo in Japan. It's a much more graceful form of martial arts. And to see somebody that large be that graceful, I think, is a little interesting. I mean, graceful and harsh, but that's what it is. But in 1985, Stephen decided he wanted to broaden his horizons and take a little break from Japan. I thought I would take a couple of years in America to do music, healing, martial arts, and writing. Stephen opened a dojo in Los Angeles and attracted a lot of Hollywood heavyweights, Sean Connery, James Coburn, and super agent Michael Ovitz, who represented the hottest stars. Ovitz knew a good thing when he saw one. He had Stephen do an Aikido demonstration for the head of Warner Brothers studio, Terry Semmel. In Hollywood, people will do anything to get to the power brokers. But after that exhibition, Stephen had the power brokers coming to him. Terry Semmel also knew a sure bet when he saw one. As head of Warner Brothers, he had the clout to put Stephen on the big screen. I kind of came here as a writer, and how about this, and how about that? You like this? And they say, yeah, we like this stuff. It's great, but we want you in front of a camera. Terry offered him three action scripts, told him to pick one, and they'd go make a movie. I read all three and I said, you know, Terry, these are all great stories, but I've got better stories. And they said, tell me one. I told them one. They said, we love that story. I said, well, can I write it for you? They said, yeah. I'd like you to write it with another writer so we can move fast. And at that time, we picked a team. We wrote Above the Law together. <laughs> Making Hollywood history, this unknown martial artist not only starred, but co-wrote and co-produced Above the Law. He played Nico, a Chicago vice officer who uncovers ties between the CIA and drug dealers. With a background in Japanese martial arts and CIA connections in Vietnam, this character was an explosive hero like no one had seen before. I never really formally studied acting, but I used to do private teachings and meditation in the martial arts and stuff. And one of the people who came to learn from me in Europe one time was James Mason. I didn't ask him to teach me acting, but everything I would teach him in, in meditation or philosophy or Zen or the martial arts, he would always compare it to acting. And the one thing he said that really stuck in my mind, he said, the secret to being a great actor is to not act. Just be yourself. And then it was easy for me. It was great to see someone bring Aikido to the screen as opposed to, I mean, you know, everyone knew Bruce Lee and Kung Fu and all of that. When it came to casting his partner, Stephen got Pam Greer, best known as Foxy Brown. The young woman who played Stephen's wife was also a gifted actress, Sharon Stone. Stephen followed up that surprise hit with another action-packed success, Hard to Kill co-starring Kelly LeBrock. This time, Stephen was a police officer up against the mob. By now, the public was on to Stephen, and the film pulled in more than $50 million. His third film, Marked for Death, which he produced and starred in, continued Stephen's red-hot streak. He played an officer for the Drug Enforcement Agency, who comes out of retirement and goes up against drug lords. You want to talk about a heavy hitter? His first three films earned more than $200 million. This puts Steven into the same league with the big action heroes. Arnold Schwarzenegger, who had come out in Terminator. Bruce Willis in Die Hard. Mel Gibson with Lethal Weapon. And Sylvester Stallone as Rambo. 
Stephen now belonged in this exclusive club of actors whose movies made hundreds of millions of dollars. I think that the most important thing in filmmaking is to have a story. And if you have a story that's about something that people care about, and from there, action is often born organically, it's the times when you don't have a story and you just throw action in there that it's very offensive or very boring. Steven knew how to keep the action and the story hot when he produced and starred in Under Siege. <laughs> He was a Navy SEAL disguised as a cook who battled psychotic military specialists threatening an all-out nuclear war. Stephen went up against Tommy Lee Jones, who, by the way, had just been nominated for an Academy Award for JFK, and Gary Busey, who had done Lethal Weapon. You and I were the same. Oh, no. No, 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 no. There's a difference, my man. You have faith. I don't. Talk about a high-octane action picture. This film exploded out of the gate and made more than $150 million. In Stephen's movies, he surrounded himself with terrific actors. Keenan Ivory Wayans, Chris Christopherson, Academy Award winner Michael Caine, Harry Dean Stanton, and Dennis Hopper. Stephen has made more than 20 movies since he started out in 1988. But in all that time, he never made a film in Japan, his spiritual home. In the spring of 2004, Stephen finally got the chance to go back home, renew old ties, and make his movie Into the Sun. <laughs> Lots of people think that when you're a superstar, you can do anything you want, and sometimes you can. The one thing Steven Seagal has always wanted to do is make a movie in Japan. So finally, in April 2004, Steven went home and brought a film company with him. Come here. And action. <laughs> This is a place that I grew up. It's my home, it's my people, my culture in a lot of ways. The director of the film is a guy named Mink, whose background is in cutting edge music videos. It's like, you know the scene above the law where you I mean, I'm a fan of his from his films, so I had no doubt that he could do everything that he does do in the films. It's not stunts, he's just doing it. I want an experience that everybody says, wow, look at that, look at this, look at you know, those moments that make you jump up and say, did you see those water cooler moments? <laughs> Most people are unaware that he lived there for 18 to 20 years, speaks fluent Japanese, spent countless years training as an Akita master. So to have the opportunity to have him back in Japan and actually be shooting on location, I mean, it was just unbelievable. Into the Sun, is Steven's first film where he's actually playing a character that's quite close to who he is in real life. In fact, this movie is based on a script that Steven wrote, and he's involved in every aspect of the story. He plays a character named Travis Hunter who has to go up against the Japanese mafia, uh, which is called the Yakuza. It's not really my life story, but part of it is. It's about Japan and the heart of Japan. We've got Yakuza, we've got geisha, we've got samurai, we've got Zen temples and monks, and so much of the Japanese culture and heritage and tradition. It's very uh, dear movie to me, very special. I don't want to mention the names of any other films, but most of us who grew up here feel that, that it's never been captured and we want to depict it authentically. I mean, it will be an authentic Japanese film for the world. Shooting in Japan was really difficult. You can't really shut off the streets. So we found a situation where we were shooting on the streets in front of a pachinko parlor for a very important action sequence to the movie. It's very hard to hold people back. If a crowd scene like that happens and the police come out, then they're going to say, you guys are making a, a, a commotion. All of a sudden, you'll see people all around me. Every one of them has their phone up in the air. Because every phone has a camera and they're all taking my picture. It's very funny. Action! 
shooting in Japan is, is completely worth it. I mean, you get the texture, you get the feel, you get this country that we've never really seen in movies before. And in this situation, we get to actually see the live streets of Japan. I want the streets the way they really are. And that's what we did. These are my people. Ain't nobody mess with me over here. You know, I've loved this place from the moment I came here. Being in Japan gave Steven a chance to get together with his old friend of 40 years, who's also an Aikido master, Hiroshi Isoyama. They used to practice a lot, but in the evenings, they found Aikido came in handy after class. Stephen was an outsider, and at six foot four, hard to miss. Various tough guys tried to intimidate them, but it didn't work. <笑>我々はそれも喜んでね、そういう歓迎歓迎したね。<笑><笑><笑> Nice hat. <laughs> Gentle hat. It's because I paid so close attention to the protocol and the language and you know how you're supposed to be. どうしたと思います。ですからその苦労が実って今の彼があるんじゃないかなと思います。だからその苦労っていうのは我々が推測できないような人には言えないような苦労をしたんじゃないかなと私は思っております。there's some people that are just born with a certain amount of um, determination, and they're not going to give up. And I don't know if I'm one of those people or not, but that's sure what I was thinking at the time, that nobody's going to break me. But there are a lot of people who have a tough time with the concept of Stephen being a Buddhist, yet having so much violence in his movies. There's a tradition in many parts of the world of Buddhist monks who believe that their body is also a sacred treasure and that they have the right to defend their lives. And they also believe in what I believe, which is that the development of the physical self through arduous training is essential in order to perfect the spiritual man. And this, this kind of training should be simultaneous. When Steven got the chance to direct, everyone expected a hard-driving action film. He did have action, but he also had an element of his Buddhist faith. We want to be able to lead people into contemplation. It should be something that can make people laugh, make people cry, teach people, can even wake people up and enlighten people. He told the story of a threat to the Alaskan environment by a ruthless oil company in his film On Deadly Ground. He cast Michael Caine as the unscrupulous head of the company. Stephen had that same passion and drive to protect the people and the environment in his movie Fire Down Below. <laughs> Stephen played an environmental protection agent who uncovers toxic waste being dumped and killing the residents of a Kentucky town. I don't know another Hollywood star who's this well versed in environmental issues, which after all are the key issues of the 21st century. Stephen's on top of it. He's done his homework. He's a voracious reader and his movies reflect that. That's extremely courageous. And he got raked over the coals for doing it. But Stephen really doesn't care what critics say. He's a man who found his spiritual path early in life and has never lost the trail. Stephen loved filming in Japan, but for some of the action sequences, they needed to tear apart the scenery, and you just can't do that to ancient Japanese temples. 
So Stephen and his team from Into the Sun moved to Bangkok to create the sets for another two weeks of non-stop work. Action! <laughs> Wow. And I can take the back of the blade, just beat him to death. Or, I mean, I can stab him, I can cut his head off, I can cut his neck, I can, you know. So he gets the gun the out here. He gets the gun out here? Yeah. He gets the gun out here, bang, bang. And, then you, and then you just bludgeon him to death. Yeah. So in this scene right now, Kawamura, one of our Japanese actors, is being chased down by Steven. He's going to fall through these soji doors. Collapse here and he's backpedaling with Steven coming after him with his katana. Kalamura gets back up against the wall, he tries to pull his gun, and Steven whacks the gun out of his hand and then bludges him to death. Hey! Hey! All in a day's work. I think Steven is great. He's done this for years and years and years. He's excellent with the sword. I've never seen like anything like it. You know, it's really, really good. And you don't need to teach him anything. He's teaching us. And believe me, there are many days we're on the set, and you know it's not stunts. He's just doing it. They're worried that this will, the the broken uh, wood and thing will come into my eyes and my face, and I just said I'm going to turn when I throw him, so we'll be okay. If this phenomenal hand speed and his quickness and his agility, and and really not realizing now working with him, he can do everything he did on screen. Well, this guy would be in pieces. Despite long hours on the set and a tight schedule, Stephen always makes time to visit the charities he supports. For more than seven years, here in Bangkok, he's worked with the Human Development Foundation's Mercy Center for kids who live on the street. Oh, they're great kids. They're all survivors. They're all survivors. And these children, I've been here many times. They call me uncle. There's about 50 AIDS kids. And uh, then we've got about another 200 street kids who from the courts and from uh, police stations and off the streets and people giving them to us. And uh, a lot of kids been abused and they all call him Uncle Stephen. So this is Nancy. My brother bought her for, for $8,000. So to save her from parents who were probably drug addicts or we're going to sell her to bad people, to be able to put her in this orphanage to take care of her. You know, when you've been sexually abused and beat up and on the streets, then somebody comes to visit you and paints pictures with you and walks around with you and you can take them by the hand, all of a sudden you're important now, aren't you? You're a person. And you see, the rule is, if you've got dignity, then you'll make it. People say, well, you can't eat dignity and yeah, all that stuff. If you've got some dignity and self-respect, you can make it. And that's what he did. That's what he does. Well, this is something the kids had drawn. I'm just filling it in. I mean, I'm using a little creative license. Now I hope for you. Now I'm your assistant. Uh, 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 uh. Now I'm your assistant. I think the pictures speak for themselves. These are all children who are dying, and they're happier than you and I. So I want to do whatever I can with small power I have, which is nothing, to bring them joy and my love. That's all I can say. I'm grateful. I'm really grateful. You're not as grateful as me. Money, which is given with love and caring, it's, has twice the value. And the children say, we want, we want to pray for him. And uh, gee, what, what greater honor can one get in this world to have an aged child say, I'd like to say a prayer for you. I, I don't think one could ask for more in this, in this life. Stephen has given millions of dollars to charities and built an orphanage and monastery in India. I don't want anybody to know anything about me uh, necessarily other than I'm trying to be as good of a human being as I can to help others. Stephen has six children of his own, two children from his first marriage, Kentaro and Ayako. He has three children, Annalisa, Dominic, and Arissa, from his marriage to actress Kelly LeBrock, who starred with him in Hard to Kill. And his youngest, Savannah, his daughter with Arissa Wolf, Stephen's partner since 1996. My kids are, you know, everybody loves their kids. My kids are spectacular.
I have two who live here in Japan, four that live in America who visit me all the time, and then I have my youngest, Savannah, who lives with me. They're all to me very, very, very special. The bottom line on Steven is that he has a lot more layers than people realize. For those people who know Steven Seagal only as a movie star, one of the most surprising aspects of this man is that he's a good musician. He writes his own music, he puts together bands, and he regularly performs around the world. You're born with a love for music. It's a kind of a karmic thing like anything else. We all seem to embrace the things that we love through past life tendencies and memories when you just can't explain it. It's just what you know and what you love. He fell in love with the blues when he was just a little kid. I've been playing music since I was born, you know. My mom and dad were gone working two jobs. And across the street, there was a, a mu you know, a big, big black family that just played music all the time. And in Detroit, it was always guitars, guns, and horseshoes, you know, and kind of in that order. And I used to sit on the, the footstool of this old man that played blues and ragtime and stuff. And I used to just sit and listen to him until one day he started teaching me, you know. Stevens played with a lot of the great talents in the world, including the legendary B.B. King. We have a club called B.B. King Blues Club in Memphis. And one night I looked up and there he was. <laughs> he was sitting in there. And uh, I had heard about him playing music. Uh, so yeah, I invited him to come up and play. He did. He's the only man in the world when I sit on the stage next to him, I get nervous. He's kind of, he really is the king to me. <laughs> After the show, we played, you know, just ideas, had fun. He's very good at playing the guitar. For years, his music was a kind of secret. The only people who knew about it were those who heard him play live. But it was his mother who convinced him to share his music with the world. It was her dying wish. The last thing she said to me before she died, she said, I'm asking you, please put the record out. Put your music out there. She loved it, you know. Stephen wrote the music and produced a CD called Songs from the Crystal Cave. Golden rule is make your album one thing. And I said, no, I'm not going to do that. I put blues, I put pop, I put rock, I put world, I put reggae, all on the same album. Because that, to me, was a world journey. Al Anderson, one of the late Bob Marley's lead guitarists, collaborated with Stephen on some of the songs. I think uh, the world will be interested in this album because the lyric content is uh, reminds a lot of uh, Bob Marley's lyrics. They're conscious. Al's not the only star who showed up to play with Stephen on the album. Stevie Wonder came in and just blew up the spot playing harp. His participation on uh, My God uh, just made the song uh, even greater than it was. I, I never picked people because they were stars. I picked them because they were my friends, and they loved my songs. Stephen's new album took a couple of years to finish, and some of the musicians came to Thailand to do the music video. Lots of these beautiful temples and just things that are really, really nice to look at and cinematic with beautiful colors. The Thai dancers and the elephants and just Thai culture. It was really amazing to see how it all came together, and it has a lot of uh, beautiful ruins from the ancient city, uh, a huge Buddha and uh, a beautiful palace in back, some beautiful women, uh, very colorful, dancing, singing, 
a lot of joy. I believe that music is the language of the gods. I believe it's the one language that all people can understand, no matter what their religion or politics or race or anything else. Music is the one language that can bring all people together. And um, for this reason, music is such an important part of my life. His CD was first released in France, where it's rapidly moving up the charts. Europe gets it next, then the United States. When we was on the set and he had his guitar and he played me some songs and stuff and some music, you know, he's, a, he's actually a good musician too. He can play the out of the guitar. Steven hit it off immediately with superstar rapper Ja Rule a multi-platinum singer during the filming of Half Past Dead. Stop, stop playing, man. Stop the car. We kind of built our little camaraderie that day, you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm going to kick your one day. I thought it was a great opportunity to be next to a, a, a good actor and, and step up my game, you know? So um, I, I had a lot of fun. I'll see you on the inside, man. Life gets complicated for everybody, but if you're a movie star, any trouble becomes public. Then there's the rumors and the tabloids. It can get ugly. When Steven took some very public hits, he had to find a way to deal with them. If you need to take a boat from one side of the river to the other, and there's snakes in the boat, it doesn't mean that you're a snake. It just means you've got to be with the snakes for the ride, and you try not to get bit. Well, Hollywood is brutal. Steven calls Hollywood cannibal town. People eat each other up and being a superstar brings with it all the risk factors and vulnerabilities that fame and stardom can inflict on any individual. Film is not about who you can and how much money you can steal. That's not what it's supposed to be about. But in Hollywood, things don't always work out the way they should. In 2003, Stephen was hit hard. His ex-partner of more than 10 years, Jules Nasso, talked to the mob about threatening Stephen allegedly over a business dispute. The FBI got the plot on tape. Nassau admitted to extortion conspiracy in federal court. He was sentenced to a year in prison in February of 2004. People that I thought were my friends betrayed me and did terrible things to me and the people around me. Uh, I got caught in situations that made all of this very public. And as you know, people uh, tend to thrive on scandals and bad news. The tabloids had a field day. Stephen has always been a target because of his exotic past and the intriguing myths that surrounded him, including possible connections to the CIA. They even hounded him during his marriage and divorce to actress Kelly LeBrock. They can write whatever they want, and, and I mean whatever they want. And we have a judicial system where they can just get around any of that. It hurts him deeply. It hurts him for his family, for his six kids. He deals with it because he's very spiritual. In Buddhism, we say that one shouldn't swell up with pride when we're praised and things go wonderful. And we shouldn't shrink in uh, humiliation when we are denigrated. His friends wanted him to fight back have press conferences, but that's not Stephen's way. Rather than me going on Larry King Live, which everybody wanted me to do, to tell everybody, you know, how I'd been vindicated and all this, I wanted to just sort of leave that stuff alone and try to make people laugh. That was my way of saying there is a medicine for all poison. Focusing his energies on another aspect of his career, this action hero decided to reveal his comedic abilities and have fun with his tough guy image. I'd get people on the ground 
faster by making them laugh than I do with the martial arts, so I think I'm pretty funny. I never really knew about his sense of humor until I met him, but he's always making jokes and he's always seeing the humorous side of pretty much every situation. <laughs> commercial. <laughs> Steven just did a big campaign for Pepsi for their Mountain Dew yeah. commercial. I just want to make sure this was a break. Tell me. There you go. <clears throat> oh, that's the problem. Hey, shoot one. And action. <clears throat> Steven's goal is all about energy and intensity. And cut. That's good. cut. In this spot, we have them in a kind of a fun little irreverent, unexpected twist that's perfect for the brand. I bet you like an autograph, huh? Whatever. Yeah, I can't believe it's me either. The best thing about working with Steven is probably his sense of humor. You know what I mean? He's a funny dude. He keeps you, keeps you going on the set. <laughs> I'd love to see Steven do the roles that Leslie Nielsen was doing 10 years ago. I mean, Steven, I think, is that funny and could actually have that kind of a career while also maintaining his action career. I mean, as an actor, I think if you hold on to one image, you're not really sort of a, a whole actor. You're kind of more one note. I mean, you have to sort of throw your own ego away, and that's kind of what I'm trying to do. It's tough to change an image that's been so successful. But while he expands his boundaries, it's doubtful Steven's ever going to let a bad guy get off with just a joke. Steven and his crew had six long weeks of filming in Japan and Thailand, and the end is finally in sight. Any movie is a lot of work, but action films are much more demanding. You're getting tired, aren't you? When you come around over my shoulder, you'll be able to see that he's you know, going like this with a sword, but for this, it doesn't matter. You just want to get me. Right. Right again, right away. Being a Buddhist, Stephen handles the stress of filming with a little help from prayer. You wake up in the morning, you do your meditation and your prayers, and you ask Lord Buddha to get you through the day, because there's a lot of work. This is the final scene in the, in the, in the climax of the film, where Steven's facing his anti-hero, the character named Kuroda. And it's the final sword battle between the two, kind of showing, and it's basically going to show the audience the skill of both players, and ultimately, I think we know who's going to win. But uh, it's, it's going to be a great scene. Hey! And action! Hey! This guy has killed my fiance, and uh, I found him. I'm going to punish him for it. I think the thing that I like best is writing. Uh, I like producing and directing a little bit. The thing I like least is acting. You know, I don't really love being in front of the camera too much, but um, I like to have my imprature on everything I can to try to protect the quality and the dignity and the heart of the piece. You know? When he finishes this film, Steven's off to Bulgaria to start another action adventure. Six months later, there's a third movie already in production. Recently, he had a very funny role in a movie based on the internet comedy magazine, The Onion. But we can't reveal the plot, or somebody might get hurt. You want me to do something else? Uh, I, I, I could use a chopstick. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I like that. I like that. A man as talented as he is, I think could do most anything that he decides he wants to do. He really does want people to like him. He really is caring. He really does want to have the best for people. I know that that's not the image, but that's the man. Whatever trials Steven's been through for more than 25 years, at heart, this is a man who loves telling stories and making movies. 
I find it exhilarating to see a movie that's been done well in the end when it's really uh, finished. That's exhilarating. I'm not really attached to any image, and therefore I don't like, uh, you know, people sort of looking at me in one light. You know, I'm multidimensional as all humans are, and um, I would like to just be able to be regarded as somebody who is here to try to make the world as a better place, because that's why I'm here. A little bit too violent for me. When the girls start to strut, you could look at their butt, you shouldn't do that. The girl dress is just a pity, not just there to cover her kitty. When me and fling it up, you better not to back it up. When me and dash it up, make sure you black it up. If you ever flap it up, then me and go lock it up. Pack it up like Benji who a drop. So.